for Excellence in Online Ministry over the past year for the first annual Online Ministry Awards, the first ever winner for this category for Best Outdoor Service is... But without further ado, the winner is Reverend Catherine Britton. <laughs> I love being outside. I love the trees. I love hiking. I love being by the ocean. I love wild church because I think that we experience God in God's beloved creation in a whole different way in our bones. I love the imagery from scripture that talks about creation clapping its hands. Come on. Come on. Well, um, Sylvan United Church is really important to um, happen to me because when we moved here in 1997, we knew one Canadian, one Canadian that was my cousin in Victoria. And so we looked for a community. We were looking for a community we both were used to being part of church. So the first Sunday, we, uh, we were at Shawnigan Lake Church. At the end of the service, a woman turned around and practically forced Hap to join the choir. And the second Sunday that we were in church, at, at, during the coffee hour, a couple came up and invited us for supper and spent three hours finding out if these United Methodists would fit into the United Church of Canada um, philosophy or, or theology, you might say. So by the time the second Sunday was over, we were part of the Shawnigan Lake community. And the Shawnigan Lake community was a part, church was a part of their community. I remember the choir went caroling through the neighborhood one of those Christmas seasons before we moved out of Shawnigan Lake. Then I was thinking, that, show, that the Sylvan United Church, where it's located, it's an incredible part of a line of businesses that are part of the larger community. You start with Salvation Army Store, and you go to the Francis Kelsey School, then you come to our church, which has a big sign that makes everybody feel welcome, including the labyrinth. And then you go to the old Bill Bay Community Hall, and be, which is still in use. And then beyond that is the Cary Park Community Center. And I think, to my goodness, if we didn't want to be part of the community, we shouldn't be sitting there on that road. So to me, um, being part of a community gives means that you give to the community. And what we get out of that is we are also part of a community. 
And since we are a community of faith, that's what we can highlight along with all the other wonderful services that are being highlighted along this road to Shawnigan Lake. We can highlight the fact that we are a community of faith and that is how we live our lives. That is how people see us and connect with us in many different ways, including including Sunday morning worship service. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, there was a trinity, not the one you're thinking of. It's a different trinity. It's called time, talent, and treasure. That's what makes us part of a community, and that's what makes a community part of the larger community. Time, talent, and treasure. And so many of you have shared so much of that. I'm just always overwhelmed at what I see. So I'm glad to be, we are glad to be part of the Sylvan Church and we would expect it to be our primary community for the rest of our lives. Okay. John 15 verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Hello, beloved community. I am the Reverend Catherine Britton, minister at Sylvan United Church. And today I am here at Blue Grouse Winery. And I am here with the owner of Blue Grouse, Paul Bruner, who has generously agreed to be interviewed about wines and vines and terroir. I'm going to invite you to come on in here. So I'm wondering if you could tell us how long the winery has been here and then how long have you been part of it? The first plantings were done here in 1986. So the winery and the, and the uh, vineyard has been here for quite some time. Uh, the previous owner set up his winery in the house down there uh, in 1990 and it was first opened in 1992 for the public. Uh -huh. So it's been around for over 30 years now and we bought it in 2012 so we're coming up on nine years, it'll be nine years in July. Okay. And uh, since that time we've done a lot of expansion and we're yeah. still in that process. Awesome. Um, I wonder if you could tell me about the idea of terroir, somewhereness. Like what is terroir? What does that mean to you? Well, t everybody has a different definition of terroir, I'll say that first and foremost. But it's a combination of the climate that you're in, the soils, the uh, the type of plantings you do, the people that work it, you know, the historic aspects of it. Why do we, why do we plant certain grapes versus other grapes? So it's a collection of all those that come together 
and produce a, a unique wine. So every property will, you know, if we grow the same grow, grape on three different properties, they'll all be somewhat different, slightly different. And, and it's those, that combination of many different elements, soil, sun, you know, et cetera, water, mm -hmm. that makes those differences. And that's, in the end, that's terroir, and some people actually believe they can taste the differences. So. <laughs> Do you believe that? Uh, I, I don't pretend to be that sophisticated. <laughs> um, what is it about the terroir of this place that comes through in your, your grapes and in your wine? What makes your, what makes your wine distinctly bluegrass? Well, I, uh, first and foremost, it's in the Cowichan Valley. It's 100% Cowichan Valley, which is uh, a pretty unique place in the wine industry. It's really at the limits of where you can grow the European type of, of wine grape. Okay. And so we're very dependent on climate. Some years, like last year, was, was difficult mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting the ripeness. Okay. But I think we're starting at, at long last to kind of get these things dialed in. And we're growing, I think, on this property. And, and most people in the Couch and Valley today would tell you they're growing the grapes best suited to, to our terroir, if you will. Okay. And what are those grapes? Uh, the uh, originally a, a lot of German crosses, so we do things that people, many people haven't heard of. Uh, Ortega is kind of Vancouver Island's identity grape. Oh, okay. A lot of people grow it. It ripens every year. It makes a lovely wine. Mm -hmm. Bacchus is another one. Uh, Cigaribe is another one. The, the the noble grapes they grow here are the Pinot Noirs and the Pinot Gris are the principal ones. It's some Gewurztraminer and a few others, but those are the principal ones. They do very well here. And we think that, you know, Pinot Noir, sparkling wine, which also ideal for cute, cool climate, mm -hmm. will, will become the hallmarks of the Couch and Valley oh, okay. over the next 10 to 20 years. Okay. Winemaking is a long game, isn't it? It's not. It, it really <laughs> is a long game. <laughs> um, I noticed on your, on your website, you talked about uh, what really matters being the kind of a shaping ethos of your business. Can you tell me how you came to that? Well, I come, I personally come from a pretty big family. We were five boys. Uh, my wife comes from an even bigger family. There were 11 kids, uh, eight girls and three boys. And so we all, the reason, we're, the way we were brought up, we all have a very, very strong sense of family. Both of us have a very common trends. So when, when I talk about those kinds of things, I'm talking about friends and family. And I, I just fundamentally don't really believe people come here to kind of taste the wine and that's part of it, but it's a romantic thing. Mm -hmm. If you're with the right people and you're enjoying those people and enjoying what you do, what they do, what you do with them, um, then you're going to have that real kind of, the, the experience that you want at a winery. And it's not about mm -hmm. the wine, it's about romance, who you're with. And that, that's where it comes so from. So the community. The, the community, community shapes the, the wine. Exactly. The community that you experience and in that moment. And those experiences are never, you can never repeat them. Okay. So they're always unique. Every time you do it, same people, it'll be a different experience. Ah, very interesting. Um, one of the other things I'm really curious about is, I, I read somewhere or heard somewhere that in winemaking or wine growing, you need to really prune the vines like somebody once told me there's like two clusters of grape per vine and in the bible reading we're going to be talking about um jesus talked about the vines get pruned so so tell me in your experience what is the necessity and and the practice of pruning and is that hard to do or is it simple like you're out of here it, i kind of tend to start backwards and go look, for it look forward, <laughs> but but yes it, it's a lot of work it's not yeah. easy to do and it really is all about renewal. Oh. So you you basically take the plant and you, there are different kinds of pruning. Uh, the, the type we do here, we keep two canes and we, we prune the vine back to two, sometimes three in case one doesn't work, but typically two. Okay. And then we look, we put, we look for seven nodes or where we'll have seven buds on each one. Okay. And those then create the grape clusters that we'll have uh, for the following year. So every year we prune, mm -hmm. every year it's a renewal process. And if you, if you look in the vineyard, you'll see the prunings uh, in, in each or in every second lane. And those are then composted back into the soil uh -huh. as part of that 
renewal process. So. <laughs> awesome. Anything else you'd like to tell us about the winery or about your experience or uh, your love for the place? Uh, we People ask me similar questions. We mm -hmm. talk here about stewardship. A lot of people yeah. talk about sustainability, but we see it more as stewardship. And the reason for that is we're here for a finite period of time. You know, in a perfect world, my daughter will take over and her daughter will take over and there'll be a, a continuity as you have in Europe. But we can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about stewardship, it's about every aspect of the business. It's about the vineyard should be better when we leave it than, than the way we found it. The winemaking quality of wine, the level of, of knowledge, understanding, education of my employees. It should be a more sustainable business in terms of profitability. So we, we're very holistic in it, uh, in terms of everything we touch should be better when we leave it than when we found it. Okay. So that's... Awesome. And then finally, you were telling me about your, um, your efforts with Nourish Cowichan that are going on this month. Every year we try and do something, and certainly through COVID, we've kind of uh, amped it up quite a bit. So mm -hmm. last year we did a, a fundraising, and we try and combine it with uh, April, which is the BC Wine Month. Mm -hmm. So we combine it with that, and, and we're raising a dollar for every bottle of wine we sell, uh, which we donate to uh, Nourish Cowishin, and then the family matches that dollar for dollar. Wow. And this year we've, we've opened up a website on Canada Helps, mm -hmm. and people who don't want to drink wine or don't live in the area mm -hmm. uh, can also make donations. So last year we raised 10000 and this year we'll... We're hoping to get to 20. We're close, but we need all the help. We can get. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, I want to say thank you so much for your generosity and willing to share. I really appreciate what you've what you shared with us today. My, thank you so my much. My pleasure. Blessings. Thank you. So our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to John, and it's part of the great I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread, I am the way, I am the light, I am the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And so naturally I thought of coming to a vineyard because we're talking all about vines and branches. and. One of the really striking parts of this scripture reading is when Jesus talks about needing to prune off the branches that are no longer bearing fruit or aren't going to give the best fruit. And I was really delighted to hear when Paul was talking about how the, the prunings get composted and put back into the soil, which nourishes the vine that will put forth more fruit. And as we are in this COVID time and we're feeling cut off from our church and our community and the building and the, the, the rituals and the rhythms and everything that we think means church to us, it's a good reminder that first of all, the church is not a building. The church is the people, the church is the ministry, the church is those of us who are bearing fruit in the world. And we need to take time to prune, to look really closely at what is going to bear the best fruit, what is going to be the most faithful to the call that we have, and what needs to be pruned. What do we need to say goodbye to? What do we need to get rid of? Knowing, knowing that even the pruning even the pruning will go back into the soil. We can compost it and it can still be part of bearing good fruit. So that's one of the big lessons to take away. Another one is to really look at what does it mean to absorb the terroir? What does it mean to soak up the nutrients, not only of the God in whom we live and move and have our breathing, not only of Jesus who teaches us to be a place of welcome and inclusion and radical love and justice and environmental stewardship and awareness, but also the community in which we are planted. We are called to be the church in the world, to go and bear fruit in the world, not just expect the world to come to us. And so this COVID time is a wonderful opportunity to go out and, and see who in the world is hurting, who is hungry, 
who is hungry for food, but also for company, for meaning, for rest, for a place to make meaning out of just the chaos and, and, and disorientation of this COVID time. What do we have in our, our tradition? What have we been fed from our vine that we can branch out and go and be the church in our community? Jane's testimony said so beautifully how we are part of this string physically. The church is part of a string of community organizations that reach out and draw in and put back out again. So I long for Sylvan to be a place where where we are a hub of community, where we are we are drawing in and sending out and being the church in the world and gathering again together in this beautiful rhythm and ritual that takes the very best of our somewhereness, our terroir. And finally, finally, the idea of what really matters, and I guess that goes back to the pruning, what is it that really matters to us as a church? What is it that gives us life? What is it that, that is just significant, that will make a difference in our world? And how do we embody that? How do we hold on to that? How do we nurture and, and reconfigure and re-embody that in the world? So, my friends, Christ is the vine. We are the branches. We are called to be community in the world, to prune away, knowing that even the prunings can give new life. So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do that will make a difference in the world at this time and in this place? Maybe it's something to contemplate over a nice glass of wine. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>